It says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, grief is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed in the world, and received of the glory. First of all, we're going to deal with the mystery of godliness, looking at these seven mysteries. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank thee now for your goodness, and thank thee for this opportunity to open the Bible. Help us to understand these things so we might uh, realize the day and age in which we live. Help us to understand that Jesus is coming again, and he's coming very soon. Help us now. We'll thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now very quickly this morning, I want us to look at, very quickly today, I want us to look at the seven mysteries. Uh, now, the word mystery is not something that is, uh, you know, like a magic. Uh, it's something that has to be revealed by God. It's something that only those on the inside understand and can appreciate. Uh, many, many unsaved people, they can read the Bible for 10,000 years and they wouldn't understand it until you get saved. You have to know the author to really understand the great details in these mysteries in the Bible. And these seven specific mysteries, the Bible tells us, they are things that God has revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. The first mystery. The first mystery is found here in 1 Timothy, and in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it talks about the mystery, the mystery of godliness. Now, there's a great deal of controversy dealing uh, with this subject because many of the new Bible, they don't, uh, they don't talk, uh, they don't uh, quote this verse correctly. The Bible says here, the mystery of godliness, and then it says God was manifested in the flesh. Now, you get some of these new Bibles, and it doesn't say God was manifested in the flesh. If you pick up the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it doesn't say God was manifested in the flesh. It says He who was manifested in the flesh. You see, these new Bibles don't like calling Jesus God. But the Bible tells us that Jesus is God. Jesus said in 1 John, it says in John chapter 8, he says, except you believe that I am, John chapter 8, verse 44, Except you believe that I am, you are, except you believe that I am the one of the Old Testament, he says, you shall die in your sin. I'll never forget it. I had a show with witness come to my house in Florida. And, uh, you know, of course, they don't believe that Jesus is God. But uh, you remember what Thomas said? Thomas said when he saw Jesus and he saw the nail prints in his hand, Thomas said when he spoke to Jesus, my Lord and my God. He called Jesus God. So this Jehovah's Witness came to my house, and I said, well, you know, the Bible says here in John chapter 8, Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am the one in the Old Testament there. You know, Moses said, whom should I say sent me? And God said, say the I am sent you. And he, Jesus said, if you don't believe that I am that person, if you don't believe that I am the I am, you will die in your sins. That's what it says there, God. And so this Jehovah's Witness said, well, I'll die in my sins then because I refuse to believe what the Bible says right there. The Bible tells us that Jesus is God. Now, I want you to notice why. They say, why do those new Bibles, why does the Jehovah's Witness Bible, why does it say, uh, he who was manifested in flesh, instead of saying that God was manifested in flesh? Well, here's what it is in Greek. In Greek, the word for God is theos. That's where we get the word theology. It's theta, epsilon, omicron, sigma. Theos. And then apparently they found some old corrupt manuscript that had left off the first two letters. And so they ended up with po or os. And that's the, the uh, personal pronoun for he. And so the corrupt manuscript has the o, and the correct manuscript has theos, or where we get the word theology. Now the thing is, this is so terribly important. Because, first of all, if you don't believe that Jesus is God, it says in John chapter 8, verse 44, you're going to die in your sin. And a second place, the Bible says that this is one of the tests to find out if a person is demon possessed. You say, what? Yes. Saying that God is manifested in the flesh is one of the ways to show that a person, if they are demon possessed or not. For example... Uh, and by the way, there's a very interesting point here. What does that mean about these two Bibles? These Bibles that change God manifested in the flesh and put he who's manifested in the flesh, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, it says that's a test for demon involvement. There's demon involvement in those two Bibles. It isn't just some human error. There's something demonic going on there. Notice what the Bible says here. It says here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. 
Hereby, why, hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. And that's why one lady has a new book out called New Age Virgin, Version, uh, Bible Version. And she points out the fact that all these new Bibles, they take out Christ, and they take out Jesus, and they take out this verse that says that God was manifested in flesh, that Jesus was God. And she said they are Antichrist Bibles. And that's what he says right here. He says here, he says, uh, this is the spirit of Antichrist. Where have you heard that it should come? And even now already is in the world. Now notice here, the Bible says this is a test of evil possession. Whether a person says that Jesus Christ is God and he has come in the flesh. And so there's a very interesting case of a man named Edgar Casey. A lot of spirits follow Edgar Casey. And Edgar Casey, uh, one time had a chance to talk to Dwight L. Moody. And Dwight L. Moody said, now, Mr. Casey, you need to accept Christ. You need to give your heart to Christ. He said, well, I don't want to do it now. Not now. Not now. And so he did not get saved. Then later, Edgar Casey would kind of fall into this trance, and this spirit would come over him and take control of him. He'd fall into this trance, and while he was just kind of spaced out there, uh, people would ask him questions. And sometimes they'd ask him about some physical problems that they had, and he would tell them to do a certain thing, and when they did it, they were healed of that physical problem. And, he, and then finally, he ended up opening a clinic. And he had this big clinic, and people would come, and he'd go in this trance, and and he actually said this, he said his soul would leave his body and go to the body of this other person who was sick and would find out what was wrong with him. And then while he was in this trance, he would tell him what to do. And there were kind of silly things like, you know, uh, go wash with the water out of the river and you'll be healed. Uh, go over here and pour some baking soda on that and you'll be healed, which had nothing to do with the uh, problem medically. Uh, go over here and pour some, uh, some olive oil on this and you'll be healed. And, and just kind of things that didn't make good sense, but the people were healed. So Edgar Casey said, well, this is a great gift from God. And the friend of his said, well, you know, uh, a friend of his said, you know, Casey, there's a way to find this out when it's a gift of God. He said, what is that? He said, well, I'll tell you what, when you go in a trance, we'll ask you some questions. And this is one of the questions they ask you. So he said, okay, yeah, I'm on a trance. Now, you have to remember that Edgar Casey consciously, at the beginning, believed fundamental, basic Bible truth. He believed the Bible was the Word of God. He believed when people died, they went to heaven or hell. He believed what the Bible said. Uh, just in general, he was kind of a fundamentalist. Even though he wasn't paper, he believed in fundamental doctrine. So he went into this trance. And so they asked him, they said, uh, and a different, different spirit would take control of him. They said, now, Casey said, uh, is Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And he said, no, Jesus Christ does not come in the flesh. Now, when he was awake, he believed that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh, that God had been manifested in the flesh. But when his spirit took control of it, it said the opposite of what the man actually believed when he was conscious. And so they asked him, said, is Jesus come in the flesh? And he said, no, Jesus does not come in the flesh. Uh, when a person dies, do they go to heaven or hell? He said, no. The spirit would answer back and say, no, there is no heaven. There is no hell. People would be reincarnated. And so they asked him a whole list of fundamental questions like that. Is the Bible the Word of God? No, the Bible is just a good book. And so that he goes through and answer all these questions that he did not believe, you know, consciously. I mean, he responded the opposite of what he personally believed. And so they showed him and said, do you know what you said when you were in that trance? He said, what? So when we ask you, because the Bible says right here in 1 John chapter 4, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is a, that spirit of Antichrist. And he said, man, I can, well, well, I don't believe those things that I said when I was in that trance. Of course, later then he changed his belief and he lined up with a familiar spirit. The point is, this is very, very important because the Bible says this is a test for demon possession. Now, there's a second mystery. The second mystery mentioned in the Bible is found right here in Ephesians chapter 5. And this is the mystery of the local church revealed in the New Testament. You see, the church age was not revealed until after the Jews had rejected their Messiah. And notice what the Bible says here. Here's a mystery. Nobody knew anything about the church age. You see, they believed that Jesus was going to come. 
He was the, the Messiah was going to die for the people, and then they would immediately go into the millennium. Uh, there was no church age or anything, but what happened is the Messiah came, and what? Oh yes, he died. And then after his resurrection, the Messiah was rejected by the nation of Israel after his resurrection. And so all of a sudden, God then slipped the church age in there. And notice what the Bible says. This is a mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament. In Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to turn there very quickly. The church age is a parenthetical thing in the Bible program of a prophecy. And he says here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Uh, and he's talking about, about the, uh, verse 31. And for this cause shall man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. He said this is a great mystery. He said what well, I'm really talking about here is I'm talking about the church. That Christ is the bridegroom, and the church is the bride. And the Bible tells us that he died for the church. This is a mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament. Now the Bible talks about another mystery. And notice what it says right here. Turn in your Bible very quickly. And turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, we're going to look at the mystery of the rapture. Not only did they not know about the church age in the Old Testament, because uh, God did not reveal it until the Jews had rejected the Messiah, but then the Bible talks about the mystery of the rapture. The Bible tells us that Christ is going to come back for his own, for those people who have been saved during the church age. And then the Bible tells us when he comes back, they're going to leave. He says, Behold. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The Bible tells us in the moment, in a twinkle of an eye, the Lord the Lamb, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible says in the moment, in a twinkle of an eye, it says the people down here in the cemetery who died are going to come up. One lady asked the preacher one time, she said, now, Pastor, she supposed uh, that you said that when Jesus comes that we're going to be caught up in the rapture, just <clears throat> like that? He said, yes. Yeah. She said, well, Pastor, what would happen if we're in the church building when the rapture takes place and we go straight up? Won't we bump our head on the ceiling? He said, no, you won't bump your head on the ceiling. He said, why not? Because notice what it says. It says, in the moment, in the twinkle of an eye, we shall be changed. The Bible says we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Bible says, now I want you to know something else. The Bible says, at the last, it says, the trumpet shall sound. Now, most people who do not believe in the rapture, especially the Presbyterian bunch, they teach that it says the last trump. You got that? The last trump. Now they said, you see there? It says there, the last trump. That means in the book of Revelation, there are seven trumpets, and the last trumpet is at the end of the, Re at the, end of the tribulation period. They said, so that proves that the church has gone through the tribulation, right? No. You need to read that verse exactly. You have to watch people that grab words and they they, 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 you know, make one word say another thing. But look what it says here. It says here, I want you to turn there. First Corinthians. And notice what it says here. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. He makes this uh, tremendous statement. Now, note, ask the question. Did he say the last trumpet? No, he didn't say that. Watch, you have to watch every word. What is the difference between a trump and a trumpet? A trumpet is an object. A trump is the sound that comes from the object. They are two different things. The sound that comes from the trumpet is the trumpet. Now let's read it again. Now I, this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption, inter and neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Nobody in the Old Testament knew anything about the rapture of the church. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Everybody's not going to be down here in the cemetery. But we shall be changed. When? Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, I don't know how many 30 seconds that was, but it says, at the last trump, not the last trumpet. You better watch that. You take that, let that say the last trumpet, and what happens is they'll try to say you tell you the church goes with tri tribulation period, which of course it does not. The Bible tells us this is before the tribulation. The Bible tells us in uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, it says the Antichrist cannot come out until after we 
are taken out of the way. It says that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. That when we are taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed. But now notice it says the last trump. Of course, these people would twist scripture and say the last trumpet. There are seven trumpets. First of all, we know that Paul here was not, was not talking about the seven trumpet mentioned by the apostle John in the book of Revelation. We know that Paul was not talking about that because, first of all, the book of Revelation had not been written yet. First place. And in the second place, he says the last trump. Not the seventh trumpet, but the last trump. Because the Romans always had three trumpets. I mean, trumps. They always sounded the word trumpet three times. Whenever they got ready to march out, there weren't seven trumps. There were only three. And the last trump, the third trump, in a Roman army was the trump to move out and to go to another place. The, for example, they would always sound a trump for the soldiers to get up. Get up, you lazy bums. It's time to get up. <laughs> okay. Then they get up, and then they would sound a second trump for them to get ready to march. Get ready. We'll get ready to march out. And then the third trump, not trumpet, but the third trump was, and then they would march out. Paul here is not referring to the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation. Paul here is referring to the third trump that the Romans used for them to march out. And he said, listen, there's going to be three trumps, and we're going to march out. The last trump, we're going to check out. Then the Bible talks about another mystery. Turn in your Bible very quickly. And it's all there, the mystery of Israel. Turn to Romans. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, look at what he says here. This is the fourth mystery. The mystery of Israel. The mystery of Israel. What is the mystery of Israel? It's talking about Israel has been set aside for a temporary period during the church during the church age, but they will be restored. They have not been cut off once and forever. Uh, these uh, these covenant theologians, they want to get rid of Israel. They don't like all the prophets that deal with Israel, and they take all the verses and apply to Israel and prophecy and say those refer to the church. No, they don't. Not when you understand what the Bible says about this fourth mystery. Notice what it says here in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. I would not have you, brethren, he said, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What's the mystery, Paul? The mystery of the temporary, temporarily setting aside of the nation of Israel. Daniel's 70th week has not been fulfilled. You see, the church age here was like a parenthesis. The church age was something here that God stuck in the middle because the Jews had rejected their Messiah. But notice what he says here in verse 25. Romans chapter 11, verse 25, he says, Now listen, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. Of course, that's the problem with Presbyterian Church. They're wise in their own conceit. And that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel. Until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And the Bible tells us that the fullness of the Gentiles here, this parenthetical expression, the fullness of the Gentiles is 2,000 years. You say, how do you know that the fullness of the Gentiles is 2,000 years? Because it says that in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. Let me tell you something, folks. From the time that Christ died on the cross back here, 1,994 years. We are coming down to the end of 2,000 years. Years. Notice what he says here in the book of Hosea. Here in the Minor Prophets, it tells us that very clearly. This is an amazing verse here in the book of Hosea. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that prophetically speaking, as far as God declares clearly in the book of Psalms, one day is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as one day. He tells us that again, again in First Thessalonians, talking about the coming of, excuse me, in Second uh, Peter, it says that the coming of the Lord is... Uh, in one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day. Now, uh, turn there to Hosea. Obviously, we'll get to that verse there about one day being a thousand years in a minute. But I want you to notice this verse here in Hosea, and then we'll get to the proof text. Notice what he says here in the book of Hosea. Hosea and the minor prophets, he makes a statement. Talking about the cutting off of Israel, he says this. He says that uh, one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day. And then he says, well, good night, where's Hosea at here? Um... Uh, Hosea is a very interesting book. Uh, well, now I, need to, I need to do a whole series. These minor prophets have some of the greatest uh, passages.
Jesus in them. Okay, right here before the book of Joel, the book of Hosea. Now turn there to Hosea chapter 6. Notice what it says here. We'll start with verse 1. It's talking about the Jews being cut off. And it says here in Hosea chapter 1, I mean chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. Why? Because he hath torn. It's talking about Nebuchadnezzar and uh, the Nacarib coming through there. It's about Titus in 70 AD coming through there. It says, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. When is he going to bind them up? He says here in verse 2, After two days, after two days, he will revive us. And the third day, he will rise us up, and we shall live in his life. Now, notice what he says here. After what? Two days. Two days. Now, turn there to Second Peter. And notice here in Second Peter, I think it's Second Peter, where it talks here that a day gives us a thousand years, and a thousand years gives us one day. Yes, sir, here it is. Second Peter, uh, what does that flow into? Second Peter, in Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 8. And he's talking here about the coming of the Lord. He's talking here about the end of the world. Notice what he says here, Second Peter chapter 7. I mean, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, by the same word, are kept in store. He says, uh, by the same word, are kept in store, uh, reserved in the fire. Now look at verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. He's talking here on the whole passage here, talking about prophecy. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Two thousand years? Two days. The mystery of Israel is that Israel, that the Jews now know that. I said, how do you know the Bible's true? He said, I can tell you the Bible's true by one word. I can prove the Bible's true with one word. Israel, no nation, no nation has ever been completely depossessed of their land, kicked out of the place, and then come back and reestablished again with the same religion, the same culture, and the same people. That has never happened. But it happens right here because it's the mystery of Israel. After two days, they went back into the land. And the third day, the Bible says, Jesus will sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem and they will live in his sight. And that's 1,000 year millennium. The Bible talks there about the mystery of Israel. Then the Bible talks about another mystery very quickly. The fifth mystery. The fifth mystery has to do with death. Five is the number of death. The Bible tells us the first man that died in the Bible, died in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. The Bible says, and Adam, and Adam died. And it says that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 5. The Bible tells us that when uh, when uh, David went out to kill Goliath, the Bible says that he took five stones. What is this mystery? Here's the mystery of iniquity. I want you to turn in your Bible to Thessalonians. And notice what it says here in the book of Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 is talking about the Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity that's already work. Turn there very quickly. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And he talks here about this terrible, terrible mystery of the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And he says here in verse 7. We're going to read the context here. It says here, look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall come not come, except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin. The Antichrist shall be revealed. The who? The son of perdition. Now look what he says here in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders. You know what's hindering the Antichrist from being shown? The church. We are the light that holds back the darkness. We are the salt that holds back the corruption. He says, he who now led us. That's an old English expression that means to hinder. It says in verse 6 that we are withhold. We are withholding the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity, the Antichrist, does already work. Only he who lets, will let, he will hinder until he be taken out of the way. When we're taken up here, <laughs> then shall that, uh, then shall that, the son of perdition, be made manifest. And what does the Bible say he's going to do? The Bible says he's going to require that everybody receive a mark in the right hand or the forehead. And the Bible tells us very clearly, it says, if you do not, if you do not accept that 666, it says that seal, Revelation chapter 13, the seal of the Antichrist is the number 666 in the right hand on the forehead. The Bible says if you say no, I will not accept that 666 in my right hand or my forehead. The Bible says you will have your head cut off. It says 
in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. It says that uh, I saw them who are who were beheaded for, uh, because they received not the the, uh, the mark of the beast in the right hand and the forehead. The Bible says they were beheaded in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Now let me ask you a question. God said, okay. You want to accept this social security card in your hand or your forehead? Or you want to march over here to guillotine? That's going to be the choice. You can either take this or you take that. You know that in America they had a magazine that wanted to find out how many people were willing to sell their soul for $20. So they said, free $20 bills, come get your $20 bills. That actually happened, true story. And they, they said, come get your $20 bills. What we got to do is wait to sign this contract, but that will get your soul. You say, well, I know America will do that. You know they found one out of every seven Americans would sell their soul for 20 bucks. That quick. What do you think they're going to do when they face a guilty? It won't be one out of seven. It's going to be 99%, buddy. They'll sign up and you'll cut the head off. The Bible calls that the mystery of iniquity. Then the Bible talks about another mystery. It talks about the mystery of Babylon. Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, turning by the way of Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. It's kind of interesting. I heard one of these famous evangelist preachers on television. And, uh, you know, he's had a lot of people send in money and all that sort of stuff. So one, one day, big, big, you know, big TV ministry, he decided he would preach on what the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 17 about the great hierarchy, mystery battle. And when he did, you know what he said? When he when he went through what this chapter, chapter 17 said, he just went through it and read it and explained it and applied it. He said the next week, his, or the next two or three weeks, the next month, his offering dropped three million dollars because he read Revelation chapter 17. $3 million to read the Bible, you would lose $3 million to read the Bible. Would you have the guts to get up and read a chapter of the Bible if it cost you $3 million? I appreciate you guys doing that. No, he says here, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, excuse me, verse 5. Not verse 15, verse 5. It says here in, uh, in verse 5, in verse 5, he says this, and upon her head, talking about this woman, he says, upon her head was what? Upon her head was a name written, Mystery Battle in the Great, the Mother of Harlots, the Abomination of the Earth. Now, those were in verse 6. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, that's an amazing verse there. He said, you know what? This woman was killing Christians and, and killing believers. And I said, man, I was just absolutely amazed when I read that thing. You know why? Because it looked like it was Christian, but it wasn't. It was a mystery. I mean, here we have a guy standing here with a thing called a Bible, and he's got a cross up here, and he's got some uh, some things that look kind of Christian around there, and say, so, why, well, that must be Christian, isn't it? No, the Bible says it's called the synagogue of Satan. Those who say they're Jews or not. Now, who is this woman? Notice here, verse 9, it tells you who this woman is. Here's a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. You got that? It says the seven, the seven, uh, the seven heads here are the seven mountains. And you go through here. Now look what it says. Also, it says that this woman has power over the kings of the earth, and the city of Rome, Rome is on seven hills. And by the way, even the Roman Catholic church admits that this refers to the city of Rome. We say, well, how do they get around that? Well, they say these verses refer to a pagan Rome of the past. But all these verses, folks, are talking about the future. They're not talking about the past. But they do admit, yes, this is the city of Rome, but it's talking about Rome in the past. Oh, no, no. All this stuff is talking about the future. And the funny thing is, they have they have a God that is not the God of the Bible. They have a Bible that's not the Bible of the Bible. They have a counterfeit Bible. They have believers that are not believers. They have a spirit that is not the Holy Spirit. It is another spirit. They have believers. You got that? They believe a lie, the Bible says, that they might be damned. They have believers who are not believers in the truth. Uh, turn your Bible to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is amazing. Let me tell you something, folks. Adolf Hitler believed what he was doing when he was promoting and, and uh, helping the Catholic Church.
but notice here, do you know that you can believe, you can be a believer and go to hell unless you believe the truth? Now, sincerity is not enough. If a person sincerely believes, I, I read here some time ago, a guy was at a drama, and he sincerely believed, I mean, they were going to play and they had some props, and one of the props that they had there was a gun. And somebody had been out, uh, been out target practicing with a gun, and they had live shells in it, and when they brought the gun in for the, to use it as a prop at the, in the play, uh, he forgot to take all, he thought all the live shells were gone. And so the actor came on there, and he thought, he really believed the gun didn't have any bullets in it. But he put it to his head to show everybody he wasn't afraid of that. But then when he pulled the trigger, you know what happened? Blew his brains out. He said, boy, what is that? Well, he believed it wasn't loaded. Listen, you may just what you believe. You better make sure you're right. Sincerity, if you are sincerely wrong, you could get killed. If you're sincerely wrong, you could end up going to hell. You know that? And of course, that's what the Bible says here. It says that they believe. I want you to turn there. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice what it says there here. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all the seemableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the knowledge of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God will send them strong delusion. The strong delusion is the Antichrist. That they should believe a lie. Why? That they might be, now notice what it says, that they should believe a lie. They really believe. Believe what? A lie. That they might all be damned. Oh, they are sincere. They believe. But they believe the lie. Sincerity is not enough. I'll tell you right now, I'd rather have a doctor who is just a money-grabbing, greedy wretch who was right than have some sincere, sweet doctor who was wrong and killed me on the operating table. I already have got it right, man. You better find out what the facts are. Sincerity is not enough. The Bible here talks about the, the mystery of Babylon. Mystery Babylon, mother of harvest, abominations of the earth. Then last of all, the Bible tells us Jesus comes back, sets up the kingdom, and the last mystery. The last mystery is the mystery of the revelation. The mystery of uh, the revelation. Turn that very quickly to Ephesians, the mystery of his revelation. And that is that Christ should be all in all. And God is going to bring everything back into harmony. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven, the first earth to pass away. And talk about the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Turn there very quickly. Ephesians chapter 1. This is the last mystery when the whole thing winds up. and says that God is all in all. You see, the world's a mess. The world's kind of schizophrenic these days. So there's good and evil, you know, that's... Uh, it's kind of scary. The world's divided in a dualism. There won't be any dualism in eternity. There will only be good. There won't be good and evil. It will only be good. Notice what it says here in Romans chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9, he says this. It says, there is another tremendous mystery here, and that is that this mess that we have to contend with day in and day out is going to be wound up. The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming. Notice what it says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. When we'll start verse 8. Wherein he hath abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now look at verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. What is the mystery of his will? The mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one, not a dualism of good and bad, just one all good, Gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and in the earth, even in him, in, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. It says all things will be gathered together. The Bible says there will be no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain, for the former things have passed away, and it will be good and evil. It'll just be good. He said, the mystery of his will, the mystery of the revelation of all things in Jesus Christ. And the thing is, the Bible tells us that Christ died on the cross so that you could participate in that great mystery of his will. You can participate in a new heaven, a new earth. You can participate with no more sorrow, no more death, no more pain, for those things will be passed away if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you 
you say no to Christ, the Bible says you be cast into the lake of fire. If you're if you're watching this at this very moment and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, right where you're sitting, you need to bow your head and say, you know, I, I've done things that are wrong. I will not participate in the mystery of His will, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and unless I accept Him as my personal Savior. Right where you're sitting, you can pray and ask Christ to save you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, it says that whosoever shall call, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. The Bible says if you ask Jesus to save you right now, you will go up when he comes. You will participate in the mystery of his will when Jesus gathers all things in himself. And if you do not accept Christ, all right, now tonight, for the last message, we're going to look at scientific inventions and how they affect prophecy. Uh, turn in your Bible to Psalm 106, Psalm 106, chapter, uh, chapter 106, uh, verse 39 and 29. Now notice here the Bible talks about God being angry because of these inventions, because of these scientific inventions that will be used by the Antichrist after the rapture. It says that God will be angry and pour out his wrath. Notice what it says here in Psalm 106, verse 29. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague broke in upon them. Look what it says down in verse 39. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and they went up whoring with their inventions. Then the Bible tells us again in Ecclesiastes. Turn there in the book of Ecclesiastes very quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Notice it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Though this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but, but, they sought out many inventions. And of course, last of all, turn your Bible to Romans chapter 1. Scientific inventions that are used by men in the last days, in the prophetic age, to, uh, to be against and to fight against God. It gives a whole list here of Romans chapter 1. And it says here in Romans chapter 1, start verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, malice, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malign uh, mal malignity, whisper. Now watch this. Backbiters, haters of God. And then it goes on down and says, inventors of evil things. Look at that. Inventors, haters of God who invented evil things that will be used by the Antichrist. All right, sir? Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank thee now for your goodness. We thank thee for this opportunity to open the Bible. Help us to understand these things, how these scientific inventions fit in with the last days. And we'll thank you for it now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now very quickly tonight, I want to draw a picture about these scientific inventions and how they fit in with the prophecy. And what the Bible has to say about it. There are all kinds of things today to prove that we are living in the last days. And show many of these things come out very clearly as evil inventions that will be used by the Antichrist in the prophetic age and in the close of time.